So in this video, we're going to cover the three main controls of exposure. Understanding exposure is pretty simple, and it's complex at the same time. Essentially, you just want to know how to get a photograph correctly exposed based on your creative intentions or your technical intentions. You want a photograph that's not too bright or too dark, which would be called overexposed or underexposed. Exposure is controlled by three factors in the camera, ISO, shutter speeds, and f-stops. Exposure is controlled by three factors in the camera, ISO, shutter speeds, and f-stops. Together, they form what is known as the exposure triangle, where each of the three interrelated elements must be balanced in order to achieve correct exposure. Really, you can think of the exposure triangle like this too, along the sides instead of the corners. The important concept is you need all three in balance to have a correct exposure. And again, this is regulated by the camera's light meter, which we'll get into later. Let's start our discussion by talking about a stop of light. Understanding what a stop is in photography is the key to understanding the exposure triangle. In photography, a stop refers to the doubling or halving of the amount of light that makes up an exposure. Each photo that we take requires a certain quantity of light to expose it correctly. Our light meter does help with this. Now adding a stop of light by doubling the exposure will brighten the image by one stop. Conversely, decreasing an exposure by one stop, which is halving the amount of light, will darken an image by one stop. So how do you add or take away a stop of light to make it brighter or darker? To do this, we just need to change either the aperture, the shutter speed, or the ISO, or ISO. Let's look at each of these individually. ISO stands for the International Organization Standards. Yes, it's not in the order of the acronym. ISO is a standardized industry scale for measuring your camera sensor sensitivity to light. Essentially, ISO measures and sets the sensitivity of your digital image sensor. Typically, on every camera brand, there's a button to quickly access the ISO settings. Once you press the ISO button, use the camera scroll wheel to adjust or toggle the ISO that you want. Notice on the top of this camera LCD, the ISO is set to 400. Notice how the ISO is displayed on the back of the LCD. Different cameras do it different ways. So the ISO controls the camera's sensor sensitivity to light. ISO and whole stops. This is the standard ISO scale from 100 to 12,800. Notice the numbers either double when moving up a stop and have when moving down a stop. So from 100 to 200 is a movement of one stop. Remember, a stop is photo slang for one stop of movement in exposure control, and the term stop can be used for ISO, shutter speed, and f-stop movements. ISO does control the sensitivity of the camera sensor to light. Got to remember that. The lower the number, the less sensitive to light. The higher the number, the more sensitive to light. So where do you start? ISO 100 is a good choice to start with during almost everything, but especially during outside daylight photography, or when you want the finest grain or the lowest digital noise possible. ISO 400 is a good choice when you're shooting inside shots or in lower light. But remember, in order to get a correctly exposed image, you set your ISO first, based on the lighting conditions you're in, and then you balance out the shutter speed and the f-stops with the light meter inside your camera. The trade-off is the ISO controls how noisy the image is, so the more sensitive you set the ISO, the more noisy your image will look, kind of like film grain in the film days. Here's a shot of a bride leaning against a tree. Notice how there is no digital noise in the shot that was taken at ISO 100. And then notice the high amount of noise taking the exact same shot at an enormously high ISO of 12,800. Noise is not always a bad thing and can sometimes be used with artistic effect. Typically, the more expensive camera you own, the better it is at capturing lower noise at higher ISOs. Now, remember the exposure triangle made up of ISO shutter speeds and f-stops? F-stops control the exposure by regulating the amount of light striking the camera sensor. These are typical f-stop numbers, and they control the size of the opening in the lens, which is the aperture. Now, in photography, f-stops and aperture are pretty much used interchangeably, and that's totally fine to do. In order to get a correctly exposed image, again, you set the ISO first, and then you balance the shutter speed and f-stops with the light meter inside the camera. Now here's a close-up of an f22 opening. Notice how it is really tiny. The bigger the f-stop number, the tinier the aperture hole. F-stops work much like our eyes. 
where the iris and the pupil function like the camera's aperture, diaphragm, and aperture, so that the pupil and the aperture are the actual holes that let in light. The f-stop measures the size of the hole. So f-stops are the numbers that relate to the size of the aperture, which is the actual opening of the lens. But again, in photography, f-stops and aperture are used interchangeably, and again, that's totally fine. Now notice the inverse relationship between the high f-step num number f22, again, and the really small hole. Here are the f-stops and hole stop movements. Now f-stops control two things. They control the amount of light that strikes the sensor based on the size of the aperture. Each movement is a stop, either doubling or halving the amount of light. And notice how a small f-stop like f1.4 has the largest opening, letting in the most light possible. Now notice that f22 has the smallest opening. A way to memorize these, because you've probably noticed that in the ISOs, every number essentially doubled or halved, depending on which direction you're going. The same is true with f-stops, but you have to think about every other number doubling or halving. That's gonna help you memorize the scale. F-stops also control depth of field, which ranges from a really shallow depth of field at the f1.4 side, meaning only one thing's in focus, to a maximum depth of field at the f22 side, meaning everything's in focus. Now, different lenses and camera systems can go down to f1.2 and all the way up to f256. But most DSLRs and mirrorless lenses will range from f2.8 to f22. Some point-and-shoot cameras will be even more restricted than this, and that's totally okay. Now, notice how the f-stop of f2.8 is represented on the rear LCD and the top LCD. Each camera brand shows this in their own way, but the f-stop numbers in whole stops are all the same. Now, just so you know, most cameras have one-third and half-stop increments in between these whole stops, but we're just going to cover that later because that can kind of get confusing. Let's just focus on the whole stops for ISOs, shutter speeds, and f-stops right now. It makes it really easier to understand and memorize. Depth of field, DOF for short, is defined as the range of acceptable focus. This is controlled by f-stops. That's one of the three ways to control it. Let me repeat, depth of field, DOF for short, is defined as the range of acceptable focus. So when you want to isolate a subject within its background so that only the subject is sharp and everything in front of the subject and behind the subject is blurry, you would choose an f-stop on the f1.4 to f4 side of the scale. If you want everything in focus, from where you stand to as far as you can see, you would choose an f-stop on the higher side of the scale, like f16 or f22. In this field of flowers, shot at f22, notice everything is in focus from the flower in the foreground to the flowers in the background. Now looking at the f-stop scale again, when you want one thing in focus, choose the smallest f-stop on your camera. Then, one flower, the one flower you focus on will be sharp and everything else will be blurry. I did mention there are a total of three factors that control depth of field. Your f-stop is the primary one of those, but there are two other factors that control depth of field, subject to camera distance and focal length, but we'll get more into that later. So f-stops, in whole stops, memorize this. It makes your life so much easier so you don't have to be thinking about it when you're out shooting. So f-stops and whole stops go from f1.4 to f22. Now remember, your lens may not go all the way down to f1.4 unless you have a prime lens. And we'll get into the difference between prime lenses and zoom lenses in a later lecture. But if you have a zoom lens that has a range of focal lengths from like 18 to 55 millimeter or 24 to 105 millimeter, something like that, any kind of a zoom lens, then it probably only goes down to f3.5 at the wide angle setting of that lens. And it may shift all the way to f5.6 whenever you try to zoom the lens to its longest focal length. That's because zoom lenses normally, like average mid-price consumer zoom lenses, have variable apertures that are based on the focal length chosen. So this is a point of confusion for a lot of beginning photographers. So let's really focus on it for a second. I'm showing you the 18 to 55 millimeter lens in both Canon and Nikon. Again, this logic applies totally to any kind of lens. You know, Sony lenses, Pentax lenses, doesn't matter. It also applies to any other focal length range, like there are lenses that go from 24 to 105, or 18 to 300, or 70 to 200. There's even wide angle zooms that'll go from like 12 to 24. So you have a lot of options. But I'm focusing on these two because, again, these are the most common lenses that come with your 
camera kit with the body and lens together. So 18 to 55 millimeters, that's the range of focal length, right? So basically, if you have a variable aperture lens, like this lens, an 18 to 55 millimeter has a range, an aperture range of f3.5 to f5.6. And what that means is, very specifically, when you're shooting at 18 millimeter, you can open up your lens all the way to f3.5 and anything else on your f-stop scale. So typically, you can go from f3.5 all, all the way to f22. Okay, a quick side note, f3.5 is not a full stop. That's why it's not listed on the full stop f-stop scale. So you can actually try to figure it out. f3.5 is probably somewhere between f2.8 and f4. Again, we're going to cover in depth what third stops and half stops are. Essentially, just learn the full stops for now. But if you want to zoom in on something and you zoom in to 55 millimeters, you no longer have access to 3.5. Your camera won't let you access it. It won't let you access f4. F5.6 is the fastest lens opening you will have at 55 millimeter with this kit lens. I've got to say, that can be okay. Here's a little pro tip to, again, prevent any other confusion. You've heard in my lectures to this point that if you want to isolate one thing in focus, that you need to choose the lowest f-stop on your camera. So here, you're going to look at your lens like, okay, the lowest f-stop I have is f3.5, but that's going to force you to go to 18 millimeter. Remember, there were two other factors that affected depth of field, and one of them was focal length. And that's kind of a big thing. I would rather you shoot at 55 millimeter at f5.6 because you'll get a shallower depth of field than you would with 18 millimeter at f3.5. So again, lenses with variable apertures mean that the aperture changes based on your focal length. On an 18 to 55 millimeter lens, you can achieve a 3.5 aperture when zoomed all the way out to 18 millimeter. But when you zoom in to 55 millimeter, the widest aperture available is only going to be f5.6. Lenses with variable apertures mean that the aperture changes based on your focal length. Remember that. All right, let's continue. If you buy the high end professional zoom lenses that cost like $1,500, $2,500, then you can have a fixed f stop across all the zoom focal lengths. But we're going to get into that later in the lens lecture. So don't stress about that right now. Just know that your lens may have a, a variable f-stop based on the focal length you choose. And if the lowest you can go is 5.6 because you are zoomed way in, that's perfectly appropriate. That's going to work just fine. So let's go back to the exposure triangle. You set the ISO first and then balance the light meter in your camera using the f-stop and shutter speed based on your creative and technical intentions. But also with the f-stops, you get to creatively control the range of acceptable focus from choosing to have one thing in focus or to have everything in focus. Shutter speed is the length of time that light is allowed to hit the sensor. It's measured in seconds and fractions of a second. Shutter speeds not only control exposure by setting the length of time that light strikes the sensor, again, typically in fractions of a second, it also controls the speed of your subject, allowing it to be frozen or blurred based on its movement speed. Slow shutter speeds will allow moving subjects to record as blurry. Remember, you have to be on a tripod for this to show the contrast of sharp things with the movement blur. Otherwise, everything in the image would be blurry. Fast shutter speeds freeze action. Here's an external shutter speed dial ranging from 1 second to 1 1,000th of a second. The B is for bulb, meaning you determine the shutter speed in whole seconds based on how long you keep it depressed, typically with a shutter release cable. You actually can use these same shutter release cables with digital cameras. Most digital cameras today go all the way down to 30 seconds on their shutter speeds before B. And notice the shutter speed is set to 1 1,000th of a second, which is a really fast shutter speed. It will freeze most all human action. Here it is on the rear of the LCD. On the top of the LCD, most cameras do not use fractions because they know that photographers understand that shutter speeds are typically in fractions of a second. So here's the shutter speed scale in whole stops from one second to one two thousandth of a second. Notice when you move up or down the scale, the shutter speeds either half or double. Remembering each one stop movement is called a stop. A sixtieth of a second is the slowest shutter speed that you should hand hold your camera and expect to get a sharp image. Now, are there exceptions to this? Yes, some of today's cameras have image stabilization or even multi-axis gimbals on the sensor, allowing for much slower handheld shots. As a rule of thumb, try not to shoot under a 60th of a second unless you're using a tripod. 
A two thousandth of a second is a tiny sliver of time that light is allowed to hit the sensor. And if you have trouble with fractions, just think of a pizza. Like I would rather have a whole pizza, which is one second, one whole pizza. And if I'm sharing it with a friend, I would give them half the pizza, which is a half of a second. Now, if it were a big party with a thousand people and everyone wanted a slice, thousandth of a slice of that same pizza is a really small fraction of that whole pizza. So fast shutter speeds like one one thousandth, one two thousandth are really fast and can freeze action. And it only allows a tiny sliver of light to hit the sensor just for the tiny amount of time. Slow shutter speeds like one fifteenth and slower let in a lot of light. And if something's moving, it's going to be blurry. Each movement is a stop, either doubling or having the amount of light. For creative control, if you want blurred motion, use from a 30th and slower for moving subjects. Remember, you need to use a tripod or stable surface with a slow shutter speed. This will keep everything in focus that isn't moving, and everything that is moving will blur. The slower shutter speed in relation to the speed of the subject, the more blurry the movement will appear. The exception to this is panning. Panning is one of the few times where you don't have to use a tripod as you move with the speed of your subject with low shutter speeds. It'll sort of freeze the moving subject and it'll give this dramatic movement blur behind the subject. We'll get more into that during the shutter speed lecture. So this is how you get that soft blurry water in waterfalls and rivers and lakes while the rocks and the trees stay sharp. Again, or when panning, a technique we'll cover in detail later, will allow you to move the camera with your subject speed, making the background blur with movement, like the speeding train. But in addition to subject and motion control, remember shutter speed also controls how long the light hits the sensor. Remember, our eyes have a huge dynamic range. Think of dynamic range as the range of tones from white to black in any given scene. We can see into dark shadows and into bright sky in the same scene with our eyeballs, like this one. But our camera's sensor can't. In a high dynamic range scene like this one, we would have to take a minimum of two exposures and blend them together in software. And if we were blending them, we would want the ISO and f-stop to stay the same. So the noise and the depth of field would stay the same. So we would vary the shutter speed. So the shot on the left was set to 1 60th to expose for the shadow area. And the shot on the right was exposed at 1 2000th to expose for the bright sky. Then you would blend them in Photoshop or Lightroom to get the best possible exposure on both areas, which is most close to what our eyes would see with detail in the shadows and the highlights. Looking at the shutter speed scale one more time in whole stops, remember that shutter speeds control the speed of your subject, either blurring it or freezing it. And shutter speeds control how long light hits the sensor, allowing more light with longer shutter speeds like a half a second or longer, or allowing less light like a thousandth of a second to hit the camera sensor. Each movement is a full stop, either doubling or having the amount of light. And remember, doubling is going towards one second, having is going toward the two thousandth of a second. If you want to free subjects in midair, you need fast shutter speeds, like a 500th or faster. This shot was taken at one two thousandth. This will freeze a subject in midair. To review, exposure is controlled by three primary factors, ISO, shutter speed, and f-stops. Now, as a side note, obviously existing light levels and subject reflectance will have a bearing on exposure, but they can still be controlled by the three primary camera controls. These are the three controls that regulate the light hitting the sensor. Hopefully this has given you a brief understanding of exposure and how you can control it. During this course, we will go into much more detail with each component involved. The best way to study photography is to really look deep into it, learning the technical and aesthetic considerations, to focus on all the tiny components that make up the craft. And so Adam said, in photography, there is a reality so subtle that it becomes more real than reality. You must also look outside of the technical details and see the big picture, the arty side of it. Photographs open doors into the past, but they also allow us to look into the future. These are your creative controls. These technical parts that control exposure also allow creative control of how your image looks. So how do you use these three components of the exposure triangle? That is all about using your light meter and understanding equivalent exposures, also known as the law of reciprocity, which I'll cover in another video. Yes! Hey, if you like this video and it helps, you can help me. Smack it, whack it, and crack a lack it. Take care. I like subscribers. That's awesome. <laughs> Whoa. Yes! <laughs> Hey, you stayed to the end. You know what that means. <laughs>
you're awesome. I'm talking about you. Now get out of here.